This is Vince Burke again from Riverbed. Um, I, uh, I'm the chief security architect. I also lead the um, machine learning and AI um, labs at Riverbed. And uh, for the last section of today, what I'm hoping to do is show you a few more technologies that are, uh, that are, that are percolating into our products now. And finally, sort of uh, round out with what we can expect to see, right? Where this will go in the entire industry over the years. So I want to start with anomaly detection because it's one of those things that everybody just, just about knows, right? This is, this is straightforward. It's easy, right? It's a progressive variance calculation. You look at the graph here. The blue line is actually the number of active TCP connections from an app response. It doesn't really matter. It's a blue line. Now, the light blue sort of river graph around it is showing you what sort of the expected normal range is. And when the blue line goes outside of that, you get a red dot. And that's an alert. It's obvious. Except it's not. Because every network is different. And every distribution of data is different. So what I've done on the right-hand side here for you is I've taken that exact same anomaly detection algorithm, and I've changed the window sizes. I have changed the bucket sizes. I have moved between normalized and absolute, right? And I've changed the actual, what we call variance decay, like how quickly do we converge back to an expected mean after the amount of variance in the data starts to um, change. This is not all abracadabra. All I'm trying to say here is that depending on how you configure your anomaly detection algorithms, you're gonna get a lot of anomalies, very little anomalies. And out of the gates, this is really hard to configure for me in the lab to work well for you in the field. So how do we approach this, right? And, and if you take a look at the right-hand side there, those graphs, what they're actually showing is, um, you know, the 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 expected range is now the green bar and the data is light blue, you know, a little consistency there. Um, you know, and um, there's another factor that we want to talk about or what did I want to make you aware of? Because not all anomalies are necessarily, or not all changes in network state are necessarily anomalies, right? So um, this is something that sort of a lot of people have trouble wrapping their heads around. And I'll give you the example of a network that is most of the time either 90% saturated or 10% saturated. The average state is that the link is about 50% saturated with a variance that can go to 100% or 0%. There's never an anomaly. But now imagine that anytime that that link is at 100% busy, we have really poor VoIP performance, right? We get a we get a two second lag on your um, uh, on your video there, Steve, and that's what's happening, right? Now, an anomaly detector wouldn't pick that up, so there is something that we call changes, right? State changes in the system, right? And I I, I want to make sure we understand there's a difference between anomaly detection and state change detection. Um, the way we handle that is you know something called cumulative sum, right? You can obviously see like as something spends time in a different state, we spend time accumulating sort of this, this, this knowledge. And if we're tracking that, and we can, for instance, detect this bimodality of a link or CPU usage or whatever it may be, we can start to track accurately when things start to change. Now, after that, those anomalies, but you know, I was showing you a number of different anomaly graphs, we can actually start doing something meaningful here. So if I want to handle your network, which I maybe have never seen before, um, I can't sort of pre-configure these detectors and drop them in there and hope they do well. So what we actually do is we take these various detectors, these anomaly detectors and state change detectors that I just talked about briefly, and we stick them all in the product. And then when you turn the product on, they all start to look at your traffic, at your histories, at your window sizes, at your state changes, and they start drawing conclusions on what they believe is an anomaly. Now, we then go ahead and we have a vote. And we have them compete in a tournament fashion about who is most accurate in your network. So that when you deploy this technology, initially you might get some anomalies that you know, aren't that anomalous in your network after all. But as time goes by, we home in on those technol on those detectors, on those configurations of the algorithms 
that fit your environment the best, whether that be CPU time on your router or load on your link or what have you, response times, right? So we're actually making these detectors vote and argue with each other so that they sort of tune themselves to your network and don't flood you with false positives. So I'm gonna skip ahead right through because we're, we're really short on time here and I don't, want to, I don't want to rush through that, but I want to share that with you because the devil is in the details when it comes to, um, when it comes to anomaly attacks. This is not, um, it's not all that it seems. So finally, I wanna share with you um, what I think we'll see in the industry. Um, this is in line with things that Riverbed does. And then I want to show you one more little thing about predictive analytics. And we're going to skirt the line of what, um, what is actively in patent process and what I can actually share with you. But I think you're going to see roughly where I'm headed with this. And hopefully that, um, uh, that will excite you as much as it excites me. So one thing I've been saying repeatedly throughout this entire day is that there really are three C's of root cause analysis, and those are correlation, correlation, correlation. And that's what it comes down to. It is John that goes in and correlates packet response times with load on a CPU of a router with gigabits on the networks and what have you. And I got a whole bunch of examples here. They're not, you know, that none of those will be surprising to you, but what we can best hope to do is surface pieces of knowledge, relationships, if you will, that are non-obvious to the operator. Because anytime the backup runs in San Francisco, we're dropping VoIP, VoIP calls in Cambridge. What's going on with that? Like an operator would never have put two and two together. But when I surface that piece of correlated knowledge, the operator says, wow, I see that makes sense because the DNS server, we got a GRE tunnel, what have you, right? And that's what it really is coming down to. But there's challenges with that. This is why it's so hard to do in a network performance management space. Why, um, why, for instance, predicting hardware failures is actually easier than predicting what network traffic or what performance response times, you know, cloud workloads are going to do. There's a couple, and this is, these are some deep secrets I'm gonna share with you guys. Um, um, but these are true, original data science challenges. First of all, we got a skill problem because, well, when I say that there's a gigabit of traffic on the link that is either fine if it's a 10 gig link or potentially really troublesome when it's a one gig link, right? So this is, this is really sort of like a normalization problem and data from different types comes in having different coverages, looking at different parts of the network, some places we capture packets, but then a lot more places we can see flows, right? So there's an, you know, we're obscuring this data and it's hard to normalize. Also comparing events to time series. Well, flows are obviously about one period of time and they describe the number of packets and bytes in that period. Whereas when we look at an event, like event-based data, well, if I give you an anomaly alert, it could be an anomaly about the last half hour or just about the last 30 seconds, right? And comparing those things requires, you know, almost, you'd almost call it pre-processing, but it requires an understanding that, for instance, traditional neural networks don't have. Um, anomalies versus changes I did in the slide with you. Um, and then there is this really big problem in correlation, which is the very, that's actually what the graph is about. It's the first things that my data scientists came back with when I say, guys, it's all about correlation. It's like, oh, look at app response. We're really strongly correlating retransmissions with packet drops. And it's like, yeah, that's gonna be very helpful. That's how TCP works, right? So there's really a lot of sort of um, uh, you know, wisdom from, from us that also has to go in before it can become something for you. And finally, um, the data you see on networks are typically power law distributed. That don't mean anything to you. Um, most, simply what it means is most techniques work well on data that's bell curve distributed and you don't see a lot of bell curves in computer networks. All right, so what can we expect, right? In this correlation situation, right? I think what we're gonna see and what I think you'll see in the industry, I think you're already seeing is, is that this is gonna creep up on you. We're gonna see more and more technologies that do just a little bit better and just a little bit better, right? I have a pipeline in development where 
I'm bringing technologies to you that I'm showing today. And then there's a number of technologies that I'm busy patenting that will come to you in a year, or maybe two years. And then there's things that we just don't have a clue how to do yet, but we're thinking of them and we're going to figure them out. And then they will become something in five years time. Right. So this is a little bit like how how, um, you know, the, the distance cruise control all of a sudden started ending up in your car. You know, it just crapped up. The car is still great for driving and still works, but all of a sudden it's doing just a little bit better for me. And it's making my driving experience a little bit easier. So now I have time to go and write text messages to Brendan and Phil while, while, I'm, um, while I'm in traffic, right? Without crashing into people, right? And I put an example on the right-hand side there and, and John has already gone through so many of you, but it's, you know, this is generally how these things go. The network is slow. You see a lot of retransmissions. There's a lot of packet drops. Oh, look at now. There's 100% CPU time on the router, right? Router is so busy, it's dropping packets. I don't need you to go through all those steps to come to that conclusion. You need to be presented with all those pieces of information together in one screen and say, hey, this all is happening at the same time. It all stopped happening at the same time. Maybe take a look at it. It could be related and you'll know what to do next. So reducing noise, determining causality, proactively detect things, figuring out trends. I'm going to show you one in a minute. And automating those things that are simple to do. Uh, there's another whole story to tell on that. I don't have time for that today. And finally, and this is sort of what I was trying to show earlier, is can I help you sort of prioritize what is most important? And that doesn't just mean figure it out by magnitude, right? It can mean all manner of things. It could be a second or third order derivative by which I decide that. And those are all the things in which I think we'll see these products improve. So here to close out today, I've got a, I've got a little example. This is actually fairly relevant um, uh, because it's, it's kind of a set of techniques that underlies a lot of the things I, I'm not talking about today, um, but that you can extrapolate will be coming. What I've got up there is source data. It's in, uh, it's in gigabits per second. It's actually from a steelhead from Riverbed. It's them, um, like real traffic moving through. And... Yeah, I don't really see what's happening, except that I've discovered an underlying trend. And this underlying trend shows me that I'm roughly at about half my traffic level now than I was in January. Now, obviously, why is that, right? This, this starts in January, and all of, but all of a sudden, everybody started sneezing and coughing and started working from home. So the amount of traffic on that steelhead went down. But it's not obvious in that first graph. How does that happen? How does that decompose? How is this useful um, for what we want to do? Well, first of all, left-hand side is the original time series. Right-hand side is three different graphs. I'm going to tell you real quick what's happening. The first one is a seasonal component. A seasonal component is something that is the repeating part of it. Now, why is this important? Why do I want to find that repeating part? Well, if I want to make a prediction of where things are going to go, it's better if I first figure out my constituent parts. That seasonal component by the software was determined to be 168 hours, which is exactly one week. Now, it obviously repeats every week because that's why we call it a seasonal component. After we subtract that out of the data, we smooth the data, we see a first order trend that was on the first slide as well there that shows you that your traffic levels have roughly half. Now, why can't I see this easily in the original data? Well, that's because the residual, which is really essentially the randomness in the data, is actually almost twice as large as the seasonal component. And this residual is effectively the changes day to day, right? And when I know each of those components, I can do very powerful things. It allows me to start forecasting outcomes. And this is an example, and I've exaggerated it a little bit. We can all see the downwards trend here. And the blue line is the real data. And there is actually a week's worth of data. There's a weekend in there. But despite it being right next to the weekend, the software can go ahead and forecast several days into advance. And that little river graph gives you the sort of margin of uncertainty. Now, you can put this in your head and think about where this goes. This can go to um, capacity planning. This can go to prediction analysis. This can go to root cause analysis and um, uh, um, analytics, right? So these are very powerful techniques of breaking things down into their constituent parts. Here's that exact example just the other way around. 
I extend the line. Obviously, I've made it fairly um, uh, obvious so that we can actually see it. And here we're actually able to predict when we will exceed a threshold that's been set. The other possibility is that a dynamic baseline will automatically trigger, right? So we're forecasting. Now, finally, here I've got, um, I, I went ahead and, and took, um, uh, this is actually uh, link utilization. I went ahead and, and, and wanted to show you sort of what that from a data science perspective looks like. We've got a little bit of, you know, obviously um, a daily pattern happening here. Um, and I wanted to sort of show you that if I continue to predict based on the data that I've seen prior, what will happen uh, to the uncertainty in the data? Because that is really one of those areas where we're all struggling with, right? When I can obviously, that green line, I'm predicting days out, days out what your network traffic will look like. But the purple line is both my 95th and my 80th percent confidence level. Now, what I've done here too, is I've, I've gone ahead and actually plotted the real data on there, which is the, the orange line. It's a little bit hard to see, but sort of like, you know, how do we deal with this in terms of human interaction on making predictions and giving you a confidence, right? And it's a probability and people are typically really poor with probabilities.